Hey folks, following on from last week's somewhat unfair test for the R7250X, when it got, well, schooled by the budget Maxwell-based GTX 750, I thought this week we'd take a look and see how it fares against something that's a little bit more in its weight class. But before that, remember to like, share and subscribe, every little helps these days, since all these videos seem to get demonetized pretty much immediately within the first hour, before finally being reinstated. But back in the summer of 2011, Nvidia released the GTX 560, based on the Fermi GF114 GPU, a refined and tweaked version of the previous GF104 GPU seen in the GTX 460. At launch, the card came in at just under $200, and judging by a lot of the comments that you've left on the previous Fermi videos, it still proves to be a fairly popular card today, with those just wanting a cheap and cheerful GPU to power a budget build. At the start of the following year, AMD released the HD 7770 GHz edition to the masses, and with a price of $169 new, it had its sights firmly locked on the then price reduced GTX 560. Efficiency wise, it was already a bit of a wash with the newer 28nm AMD card outclassing the 40nm Fermi GPU in terms of power consumption, requiring only 80 watts compared to the GTX 560's 150. But in terms of core configuration, it was hard to decide on a winner on paper at least. The green card packed fewer shading units with 336 CUDA cores compared to the red card's 640 SUs, but it did look to counter that with 56 TMUs compared to the HD 7770's 40 TMUs. And it also doubled the number of ROPs, which came in at 32 compared to the 16 available on the red team card. In terms of memory, the GTX card also has the benefit of a 256-bit memory bus, compared with the 128-bit bus on offer on the HD card. But then, when it came to clock speeds, the AMD card had the advantage with significantly higher core clock speeds and a nice boost to the speed of the VRAM too. The HD7770 was successful for AMD, and it was eventually rebranded as the R7250X we've got here, just two years later. Overclocking can be done to some extent on both of these cards, and the final overclocked clock speeds I achieved are listed on the screen. So it should be a close call, but there's only one real way to check it out, and that's to benchmark the 250X in the same suite of games as I've previously tested the 560 with. So with that said, let's boot up the old faithful i5-4590 test rig and dive into some benchmarks. Kicking things off with the oldest title here, the 2013 version of Tomb Raider at 1080p on the normal preset, and again it returned a great experience on both cards. Here the R7250X returned an average of 65fps compared with the 560's 88, and overclocking left the 560 as the winner of this benchmark test here, with a difference of 19fps on average. Testing out the game at the high preset returned averages at just above 60fps for the 250X, but that was only when we overclocked the card. At these higher settings, even when the 560 was overclocked, the average minimums couldn't quite hit 60fps. The 250X did claw back some of that gap, trailing the 560 by 9fps on the averages when overclocked, and 6fps at the low end. So a pretty convincing win for the green team card here. Last week though, we've seen how punishing Rise of the Tomb Raider can be on older hardware at higher presets, but dropping it down to 900p on the low preset with 16 times anisotropic filtering and no anti-aliasing, it was a much better story. We did manage to keep above 30fps on the average minimums on both the GTX 560 and the R7250X, but the experience was notably more choppy on the Nvidia card at times, with the lows on the 250X flirting with 40fps, rather than the 30fps seen on the green card. Dropping the resolution down to 720p at the same settings, seeing the averages jump to well over 60fps when overclocked, and the average minimum settling much closer to 60fps than 30. The R7250X performed well here again, but at stock clocks the GTX 560 did manage to leapfrog the R7250X. Skyrim SE now, and at 1080 on the medium preset with no anti-aliasing, and even at stock clocks, the R7250X romps ahead of the GTX 560, with an average frame rate of 48 FPS, with the minimums sitting at 40. Overclocking the 560 resulted in the average frame rate jumping closer to 40 FPS, while the average minimums did manage to hit 30, but it still wasn't enough to catch the stock R7250X, which only crept further ahead once we overclocked it. 
it's a nice showing here and it was one of the more disappointing results for the 250X when I put it against the GTX 750. That test though used temporal anti-aliasing, which was much better suited to the GTX 750's newer architecture. And the 20 FPS or so difference that we can see on the 250X when simply turning AA off just highlights how taxing some settings can be on older hardware. CSGO is a game which both cars basically took in their stride, running at the max preset here, neither car broke a sweat, and either one of these cheap and cheerful GPUs of yesteryear is going to be fine if you just want to play some Counter Strike, even with a high refresh rate monitor. Moving on to Prey, and at 900p on the medium preset with FXAA turned on and 16 times anisotropic filtering, this was already a title which impressed me when running it on the 250X. And here it's much and such the same story, at stock clocks, the 560 did push slightly ahead of the R7 250X here in terms of average frame rates, although the 250X offered up slightly higher average minimums. Overclocking the 250X meant that it overtook the overclock 560, in both averages and minimums, with the 250X almost hitting 60 FPS on the percentage lows. Now, Prey is a fantastically optimised game, and like I've said many times before, simply dialing back that anti-aliasing or the anisotropic filtering is going to allow you to run at 1080p at a locked 60fps, with only the very occasional dip below that figure. Now, when I last benchmarked the GTX 560, I was actually genuinely impressed with how well it coped with Battlefield 1. At 900p on the low preset, the GTX 560 returned a frame rate above 70fps on average, with the average minimums hovering around the mid-50s. At stock clocks though, the R7 250X was even more impressive, returning an average frame rate on par with the overclocked GTX 560. But with the average minimums staying above 60fps, ensuring a silky smooth gameplay experience even in the most hectic of scenes. Up in the resolution here to 1080p, seeing the GTX 560 tickling 60fps on average when overclocked, and the average minimums managing to stay above 40fps. At stock speeds, the R7 250X matched the performance of the stock GTX 560, but with higher minimums, and when overclocked, we've seen the 250X break the 60fps barrier for average frame rates, with the average lows not too far behind breaking through that 50fps barrier. So this has been a little bit of a more realistic comparison today, but it is the 250X which, in my opinion, comes out on top. Today both cars can be had for basically the price of a DLC pack in a new game, and if you're looking for something cheap and cheerful to get into PC gaming, either of them is going to do the job nicely. At this point, I would probably opt for the R7 250X over the GTX 560, simply because it does run much cooler and quieter, and it draws considerably less power at full load. The results, they shouldn't be too much of a surprise either, while older titles like the 2013 version of Tomb Raider seem to favour the Fermi card, any newer titles, and specifically ones that have got their roots embedded in the PS4 or Xbox One, is going to be able to more effectively use the hardware at the heart of the GCN based 250X, simply because the GCN architecture is still used in the consoles from Sony and Microsoft. Going forward, I would expect that a card based on the GCN architecture is going to continue to perform slightly better than something like the GTX 560, simply due to the optimizations for that architecture having already been thought out as part of the console releases. That said though, if in your region the AMD card costs considerably more on the used market than something like the 560, then it's going to be up to you to see if that price difference justifies the very slight gap in performance and the unknown possibility of future relevance. But that's it for today folks, I hope you've enjoyed this little look back at the old Radeon R7 250X in a more fair comparison. But let me know if any of you are still using an HD 7770GHz edition, a 250X or even the GTX 560 and what you think of them in 2017. As always, take care folks and I'll see you all in the comments section down below and in the next video.